Today, we are here to celebrate the life of Anna Austin McCullough, the remarkable woman who founded Oldfield School 150 years ago, who led Oldfield through its first 37 years, and who established the inclusive, nurturing culture for which Oldfields is still known today. Anna Austin McCullough was born on October 10, 1824, when James Monroe was President of the United States and the Missouri Compromise and the Monroe Doctrine were adopted. Her mother and father were George and Caroline Austin, and Anna was the oldest of six children. In 1844, she married a Baltimore lawyer, John Sears McCullough. Anna and John lived with John's father when they were first married, and Anna's father-in-law encouraged her reading and education at a time when education for young women was becoming more common. Anna was very interested in the natural and physical sciences, and she loved exchanging ideas with her brother-in-law, who was a professor of chemistry at Washington and Lee College. This may be what inspired her to be one of the first to teach science to girls. Early in their marriage, Anna and John moved to the big city, Staten Island, New York, where John practiced maritime law and where their eight children were born. The Civil War brought many changes to daily life in America, and it put an end to the clipper ship trade, which adversely affected Mr. McCullough's business interests and law practice. So the McCulloughs decided to return to Glencoe in 1867, where John could farm. Anna's brother, Edward, offered them an old farmhouse for their home. That old farmhouse was the old house we know and love today. The Oldfields property became part of the Austin estate sometime between 1861 and 1863, and isn't it interesting to know that it was already named Oldfields before the McCulloughs came back to Glencoe? Anna's sister Alice had lived in Mississippi on a farm she'd called Old Fields because of the worn out fields that surrounded it, and Alice is the one who also gave that name to the farm that became Oldfields School. Old House was originally a log cabin and is a registered historic landmark. By the time the McCulloughs moved in, it was a yellow clabbered farmhouse with two downstairs rooms and two upper floors, although there wasn't much room to stand up on the top floor. The kitchen was a lean-to next to the dining room and there were two or three outbuildings. Water for the kitchen and the household came from springs of water bubbling up from the ground. Before long, Lizzie the cow and Pleasure the mule arrived to supply food and help with the work of running the farm. Imagine what a momentous change it must have been for Anna, who was used to a very comfortable home in the sophisticated company of Staten Island, to move to Oldfields. But the diary she kept during her first days at Oldfields reveals her to be a woman who adapted to her new life with optimism. She wrote, the place grows on me every day. It has great natural beauties. The house is a homely farmhouse, but roomy, sunshiny, clean, convenient. When they arrived in Glencoe, Anna and John's eight children ranged in age from the mid-twenties to little John, who was only three. Naturally, Anna wanted to provide an education for the younger members of her family, and it seemed logical to include some of her nieces and nephews and a few local children in her classes. Her sons, Duncan, Ned, and James, and her Gilbert nephews were among the first students. So in its initial years, Oldfields actually had male students. Also among the first to go to school at Oldfields were Carrie McMurrin and Hattie Winchester from nearby Philston, which still stands today about half a mile up Glencoe Road from here. The only resident pupil that first year was Mattie Mosley, a ward of Edward Austin, Anna's brother. By the following year, little Mary Carroll, little Allie McMurrin, and the Memphis girls, Janet and Ella Royston and their cousins Rosa Bailey and Flora Lake, had become students. You might be surprised that Oldfields drew pupils from so far away at that early date, but the girls came through family connections and the following year, the number of students increased again. Interestingly, 
Anna never liked to feel that she was running a formal school. She always claimed that she took a few young ladies to educate them. Anna's daughter, Miss Abby, helped her mother with the school from the start, while Miss Nan, that first year, was completing her music studies in Boston before returning to teach reading and music at Oldfields. Another daughter, Miss Carrie, taught drawing and painting. Eventually, Anna's son, Mr. Ned, taught Euclid what they called geometry. Garden House was built as a workshop for Mr. Ned, who was very interested in photography and had other hobbies, one of which was raising chickens. That's how the hill our girls run sprints on got the name of Chicken Hill. Even in the beginning, there were rules and regulations the girls had to obey, just as we have rules today. The daily schedule began with prompt rising and time for devotions before breakfast. If a girl was late to breakfast, she was offered a slice of unbuttered bread at a side table. There were no Dunkin' Donuts in her advisor's office to save her from hunger. Following breakfast came morning recitations, which is what they called their classes, midday dinner, a sewing hour, a daily walk, music hour, supper, and a study hour. The order of these activities changed from year to year, but the content remained much the same for decades. Anna had high expectations for her students and assumed that her expectations would be met. By 1875, Anna had drawn up a contract her students would sign, promising that they would not be guilty of the rudeness of whispering, screeching through the house, slamming doors, scraping chairs over the floor, or thundering up and down the stairs. Sounds as though their quiet hours lasted all day long, not just during study hall. Old House had no electricity, no running water, and no indoor plumbing whatsoever. Saturday night was tub night when the girls got tin pails or pitchers of hot water in the kitchen and carried them to their rooms where they bathed in tin bathtubs. Oil lamps throughout the house provided lighting after dark. At meals, everyone sat at one long table in the dining room, and it seemed like one big family to the girls. We have those same community dinners today. There were two ponies to ride on, Charlie, a sorrel, and the rat, so-called because she was tricky to ride. Sometimes Mr. McCullough would ride with the girls and sometimes Mr. Ned. Was this the early beginnings of our riding program? Even in those early days, certain established customs were loved by the girls, among them the special program on Fridays, a day they regarded almost as a holiday. Hattie Winchester wrote, The day we most delight to recall is Friday. It was full of pleasures from morning to evening. During the school hours, there were reviews, compositions, and poetry, and later came charades, games, and the Virginia Reel, a popular dance of the day. Also on Fridays, a man with a wagon selling things called the Huckster would visit, and the girls would spend their pocket money on apples, bananas, and oranges. No candy, no Coca-Cola, no potato chips. For special Friday dinners, the girls were traditionally served smothered chicken, hot rolls, fluffy buttered rice, coleslaw with French dressing, and two huge silver tankards of milk at each ends of the table. At that time, and for many decades to come, Oldfields was still a farm as well as a school, providing the school with dairy products and much of its other foods. Several Oldfields students wrote about the garlicky taste of the milk when the cows had been eating onion grass in the pastures. Students coming to school back then would be met at the railroad station down by the bridge over the Gunpowder River by the school's coachman driving two very fat, slow, sorrel horses known as the Virginia Creepers. The road up to school was either a muddy track or a dusty lane, depending on the season. In the early days, Anna used to accompany the girls on their Friday walks. Her knowledge and love of nature was contagious to the girls. In later years, she sat in a rocking chair on the front porch to greet the girls upon their return and to share their treasures. By the spring of 1876, most of the original girls had left, and Anna continued to look on them as her daughters, writing them often, sending love and encouragement 
as they faced difficulties in the larger world. One student wrote, We knew her to be a rare soul, one who gave a large interpretation to life and ennobled through her faith. She saw she was not blind to our deficiencies, but she looked beyond them in hope, and we, loving and revering her for that hope, strove to overtake it. In 1880, Anna oversaw the first major additions to the buildings, but there were still no modern conveniences. The new part of Old House was attached to the west side of the original farmhouse. Downstairs was the long schoolroom, now Miss Nan's library, which served as a study hall and dance floor for the next 26 years until New House was built, at which time it became the girls' sitting room. Upstairs were several bedrooms on the second and third floors. The front bedroom on the second floor was Miss Nan's bedroom. At Old Fields, cleanliness was pursued relentlessly. Every morning, pails of water were carried to all the bedrooms, and pitchers were filled so that the girls could wash in hand basins and dress before devotions and breakfast. The most frequently reported sins in those days were talking during devotions, lateness, breaking bounds, and eating in the bedrooms. For warmth in the schoolroom, there was a Franklin stove, which was a metal-lined fireplace. Anna sat in front of it with her worn Bible, her little blue clock, and sundry papers. There were sometimes visits to nearby family houses like Hillside and Clinmalira, which is still standing today on Carroll Road, straw rides in the spring moonlight, and even the occasional concert in Baltimore. The ponies remained popular, though they were described as stubborn and unmanageable. One girl even preserved some of Rat's tail hairs in her locket. Sometimes free time was spent in useful labor. Carolyn Hall recalled helping to lay bricks for a walkway, and that wasn't even a Saturday work detail. After outdoor activities ended, the sewing hour brought everyone together again. As the girls sewed or mended, a teacher would read aloud from Pride and Prejudice or a similar novel. In 1896, tuition totaled, are you ready? $600 a year. The basic room board and tuition, which included languages, dancing, calisthenics, and laundry, came to $500. Piano lessons were an additional $70, and painting lessons were $30. In a letter to a prospective parent, Anna wrote, that the rooms are comfortably warm, that usually two girls share a room and are responsible for making their own beds. Simple dresses that are suitable for the country life are all that is needed, and some prettier evening dress for the little weekly dances just among ourselves. A riding dress is well to bring. As to elective studies, having only 20 children and having trained girls for 20 years, I judge for them and with them what is best. I am governed by their health, mental ability, previous studies, and their own preferences. I deal with them as though they were my own children. Even that long ago, Anna was focused on each girl's success. Anna died on Palm Sunday, 1904, while her girls were away for their Easter holidays. Whether Anna's students made a future home or whether they engaged in what she called definite outside work, their appreciation, love, and respect for Anna was demonstrated in a lifelong devotion to her and the school she founded. In 1917, Francis Winchester Brown Keith wrote, Old Fields to me means Mrs. McCullough. Such dignity, sweetness, kindness, understanding, and everything that was perfect. I loved her very much and often think of her. God bless her, her family, and her school. Anna's legacy lives on today in the intentional way Old Fields nurtures each and every one of you, recognizing your worth as an individual, helping each of you to develop your personal gifts, and giving you the confidence to use your potential for the benefit of the community. Each of us owes a great debt of gratitude to Anna Austin McCullough, as we celebrate her life today in the 150th year of the school she founded. As we reflect on Anna's remarkable life, let us each imagine how we can add to her legacy and how we can ensure 
that old fields remain strong and vital for future generations of the young women who come here to become old fields girls just like you.